Hi, I'm Rick Dancer. Welcome to Get Real with Rick Dancer. And um, we're going to talk one of my favorite topics, um, forest fires, forest management, um, forests, forests, forests. That's what we're going to be all about tonight. Because part of my kind of thing is there's a part of the conversation that has been lost over the decades. And just one group of people seem to own how this is going to operate and what we're going to do. And I think what we've seen, um, and, and for me, I got a dog in the fight. You know, I when, when the fires happened two years ago here in Oregon, um, I was evacuated from my home. And at that point, I got kind of angry because I started thinking, wait a minute, you mean one group of people is coming up with a way that we're going to manage or mismanage or not manage our forests. And I could have lose my home. I could lose my home because of their um, lack of looking at the big picture. So I got kind of pissed. And um, then I looked, started meeting people who'd lost their homes and lost everything because of people's decisions and, and their unwillingness to look at the big picture. So the Douglas Forest uh, Timber, Douglas Timber Operators, uh, Matt Hill, did a, a series of videos about the Archie Creek fire. And we showed one last month. We're going to be doing this every month till we get through the series. And tonight we're going to look at search and rescue and how that's involved. And, and I think you're going to really enjoy this video and also see some things that you may not know that go on and how social media was used for this. Um, my hope is that we can learn something for the future as we talk about these things and that maybe um, there's no point in the video. It's just to document it. It's not my bias, which is to get people to start talking about better ways to manage our forests um, and stop mismanaging our forests so that they're burning down and, and destroying so much timber. And, you know, uh, one of the things I learned the last time we did this is interesting fact is, you know, a lot of this land that was burned was set aside to protect the hot, hot spotted owl. And so it wasn't cleaned up. It wasn't thinned. And that then caused the fire and it burned all that land anyway. So what the hell was that all about? So we're not protecting anything. Um, we're just uh, exacerbating the issue. So I'm going to show the video first. And then I'm going to bring on a few people, uh, Lieutenant Brad O'Dell, who's with the Douglas County Sheriff's Department. Uh, Virgil Osborne is with Search and Rescue. Um, and then Matt Hale, the producer uh, with uh, Douglas Timber Operators, the producer of the show. Um, our sponsors tonight are Buck Sanitary Service. And the reason I chose Bucks to sponsor this show is because he has a lot of showers, toilets, all those kind of important things that you need for firefighters that he took down there to the fires. Um, he was down there for months. In fact, I tried to get, meet with him when I was home and I couldn't even reach him because he's out on these fires with all the equipment. So he's kind of like one of those uh, first responders out there because taking care of needs that need to be taken care of. So Buck Sanitary Service, if you're looking for porta potties, showers for a wedding, that kind of thing, please help our sponsors out. And also Chris Daniel Family Dentistry here in Eugene. Um, he's a big supporter of law enforcement, big supporter of uh, you know public awareness, big supporter of public conversation. And we'll be doing, uh, he's sponsoring this show as well. And I'll show their commercials at the end of the, of the program. So let's start off with the video and then we'll get to our guests. I see a lot of people coming on here. Can't believe they're voting on a transient housing tax in Oregon. Well, let's, Anthony, we got lots of things to talk about, but tonight we're going to talk about forest management. So here is our video. I'm going to divert to the zero forest. Sorry, it is your location. We are at Idlewild Park at this time, headed up the river. All star units, north east, have diverted up river. Yeah, we're going to need a crew up here with saws. Um, I'm driving through the fire. There's a residence trapped. I don't know if anybody's home, uh, but I can't make it due to uh, trees falling. That. Uh, I have passed through the fire and uh, advised residents to make a rapid egress. By statute, the sheriff is responsible for evacuations. And we rely heavily on our search and rescue crews to help us make notifications uh, during emergencies. Another uh, start call out or I absolutely rely on those volunteers. They are critical and crucial to, to the operation when it comes to something of this magnitude and the scale. 
And those guys were absolutely amazing. They, again, they're volunteers. They show up, uh, they're trained, they know what they're doing, they follow directions, uh, they have an absolute passion for the work that they're doing, and they're really, really good at it. We use a um, system statewide here in Oregon called Ready, Set, Go. And those uh, have color codes associated with them. Green is be ready, yellow is set, and then red is go. And, and so those search and rescue volunteers were posting those notices, letting folks know, you know um, that this area is under a level two or a level three evacuation. Just finished with Swiftwater residents. We're headed up Rock Creek. It was mostly notifying, you know, a large number of people in a small amount of time over a pretty broad area. So many heart heartbreaking stories, you know. Uh, people, uh, we would go to their house to to evacuate them, and they would just burst into tears because they didn't want to lose their house, and we understood, but we didn't want to lose them. Be advised, Lone Rock Road is now level three. Fire jump the river. The search and rescue is coordinating evacuation efforts on Lone Rock Road, South Lone Rock Road, Barnell Ranch Road. And we ta started talking about evacuations with the Douglas County Sheriff's Department, and they said, What do you think? Uh, Idlewild evacuate? I said, Yes, and evacuate Glide and turn the corner and start evacuating Little River. Uh, sorry, you guys are heading up Little River to. Uh, is the fire behavior um, going to be something that we can do something with? Yeah, with uh, the main fire coming over the hill, um, things are just burning pretty quick. Yeah, I copy that. Um, I need to go down and speak with the sheriff. We changed that order to give the sheriff mandatory evacuation powers. I'm en route to the Glide Fire Station to meet up with the Sheriff's Office. Um, we'll be um, suggesting a level three evacuation for Glide. If the winds continued and the fire continued to burn with the intensity that it was going to actually impact the town of Glide, uh, and so the decision was made to evacuate Glide proper. That was something I never uh, prepared for in my career. I, I have never evacuated an entire town before. And I remember sitting at the post office uh, that night, must have been sometime around midnight, and uh, watching the flames. Fire has crested the ridge up here, uh, up in the area of uh, Barrel. We can see the flames now. It was obvious very quickly that this was something different than we had dealt with before here in Douglas County. Particular attention to your surroundings. Fire is moving fast. Make sure that you have adequate exit time to leave the area. Star base clear. We can see flames. So we have at least four units on Cabin Creek at Rockview Lane. And we're inquiring if we should continue pushing on up here if we're going to be able to get back out Little River. Attention star units about coming back to town. We need confirmation from law enforcement if we have a um, unit available in Little River. We're looking from the rock pit and it looks like the fire has jumped the ridge west side of the Little River. We are sitting at the beginning of Safely and we see flames coming over the ridge. It is blowing up coming over that ridge. Then get out of there. All star units, all star units, return to shed. The miraculous thing about this fire is that they contacted. Uh, all of the residents that needed to be contacted and we were, were able to make those notifications and not a single uh, 
report of loss of life or missing person uh, to this day. Um, as you can see, uh, it's really smoky out here. Um, the visibility is starting to uh, somewhat diminish. There's a lot of ash that's falling from the sky, uh, but there is definitely um, of some, a lot of information that I need to pass along, especially to the residents here in Glide and Idlewild. So initially when uh, we began doing evacuations, we were doing a couple of things. Uh, we were using press releases, we were using the alert sense or the reverse 911, and we also were using Facebook. I'm here at the Glide Fire Department. Uh, we are um, issuing a level three evacuation that has been issued for all of the residents uh, from Klahani Lane in Idlewild Park east to Steamboat Creek. That means you are being asked to leave your home immediately. You're in an area with significant fire damage. You need to understand that this is a last warning. As things progressed uh, throughout the morning, um, there was a need to get information out immediately. Uh, and so I, I was finding myself needing to just be able to connect with a mass number of people in, a, in an instant. And that's when I began using Facebook Live. Uh, level 3 evacuation notice has been issued for all of the residents in Glide and Idlewild Park. Fire officials have determined that there is a significant risk that exists in the area and it is highly recommended that you evacuate at this time. I would ask that you uh, heed the advice of the authorities that are issuing this. Understand that this has not been an easy decision. Uh, however, public safety does come number one and your safety is a concern for both the sheriff's office and all of those who are making decisions regarding this incident. Knowing that the people who live here jumped into action, had faith in the sheriff's office and the people who were telling them, this is dangerous, you need to go and that we had no loss of life is what I am most thankful for. And again, uh, this is produced by this gentleman, Matt Hill. Matt, thank you for joining us and letting me air your stuff. There's nothing better than having good stories to air when I need content. And, uh, and the fact that uh, you and the Douglas Timber operators want to get this message out to people. Um, it, 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 why is it important, Matt, for you? Well, I think uh, just watching this segment, what, what rings with me is just letting people know the human emergency that, that accompanies many of these fast-moving wildfires and the extent of first responders and volunteers and others who put their lives on the line to protect you know, the people that live in, in that area. And I think that many people, you know, associate fire with the smoke they smell, or maybe they go up there months later, but they don't know what's happening in real time and, and the serious emergency that, that it really is. And Virgil, I'm going to bring you in here because you're with search and rescue. Search and rescue. Now we're getting an echo. We didn't have an echo before. Just started. <laughs> not me. <laughs> it, it is not you. It is not you. God, just what I need to hear my sister's <laughs> Virgil, one thing I did not understand I did not think about, about, think about was the volunteers. Talk to me about that. So, you know, with Search and Rescue, we're, we're an all-volunteer team. And, um, you know, we respond for evacuations and we respond to, obviously, rescue situations and sometimes recovery situations. This particular instance, uh, we actually got our first call out in the morning, and I think it was around 5.30 in the morning for a different fire. It was uh, at French Creek, and we all headed up there. I think we had four teams working that fire. And that fire was 
mostly a, a grass fire and, and you know it was lower elevation there wasn't a lot of fir trees involved in it and it seemed to us that after we got that entire area evacuated we pretty much were ready to go back to the shed and then we got the call out to go up to, to uh, Susan Creek and uh, we took all the volunteers up there and, and what we were met with up there was crazy I mean I've never seen fire that crazy chaotic hot and noisy it sounded like a jet engine taking off up there it was bad so what do you so, learn personally you learn with search and rescue from this incident? So, you know, our mission is to, so others may live, right? And that's our, our intention is to, is to keep people from you know, obviously dying or whatever. But I, we, what I think we got from this pretty quick was we also have to take care of ourselves too. Uh, and, and we spent, uh, you know, it became really clear after the first half hour, 45 minutes of working with this fire that, uh, a couple of things. One, nobody wanted to leave because I don't think anybody realized how bad the fire was. Uh, our job was to, to at least let them know that we can't come back for them. Um, but we also had to keep ourselves safe. And that was that was a challenge. I mean, when you're driving, we literally were driving our trucks through the fire to get to these to these residences. And, and we had trees falling all around us. I mean, so we learned all we, we definitely learned how to survive and we had to make smart decisions. We couldn't we couldn't make a mistake. You could tell in your voices when you're saying "get out, get out." You guys didn't want to get out. Yeah, it was it was nuts. <laughs> I, I'm gonna bring Brad on here and Virgil. Yeah, and Virgil yeah, out to see if we get rid of that thing. Now, yeah, it's not doing it with you. Hey, Brad, how are you doing, man, Lieutenant? It's nice to have you. Thank you. I'm I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having. Only the role that social media played in all this, because that was pretty. Perf you, I mean. You're you're a lieutenant. You you probably have social media, but you're not like an expert on how to use this stuff. And uh, kind of tell me how that kind of played into the picture. Yeah. So during this incident, social media was huge. It was the very best way for us to disseminate information as quickly as possible and reach the most amount of people that we possibly could. And and I I found myself during the in, the, during the incident needing to get information out quickly. And I just felt like I don't have time to sit down and write a traditional press release like I normally would. And so, again, I just thought the very best way for me to do this is to use the sheriff's office uh, Facebook page and, and get, the, get the information out. At least while I'm typing the press release, people can be sharing the information that can be distributed. People can start making phone calls. And again, it's all about spreading the word because this was a real life true emergency so brad i don't know if you see this but becky robertson says hello everyone i was listening to it on broadcastify i was crying the holiday fire but she was listening to that you could hear and you were you were probably well because most of that can go anywhere it could go all over the place um and the, the good thing we were talking about this before we went live on here um Two, you, you didn't have to disseminate the information to the middleman, the media, and then have them put it out with any kind of, you know, uh, 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 hysteria or, you know, we've got a, a horrible scene here. You could just give straight information, which is all people wanted at that point, right? Yeah, my, my goal was to get the information out as quickly as possible, as concise as possible, and, and telling folks exactly what the problem was and what we wanted them to do, uh, what the recommended actions were. And so that was that was the, the very best way to do that, I felt. So Matt, in terms of you, you live up that direction. Um, so not only are you involved with the timber industry, um, but this is pretty personal. Yeah, my, my family uh, lived, has lived up there since the 1800s, so it, it burned multiple um, homesteads of, of my family. We, my wife and I were building a home uh, in the area at the time of the, the fire. We were living in Roseburg at the time, and, and my wife, the irony here is my wife and I had both signed up for search and rescue with Douglas County a couple months before, but because of COVID, we couldn't get through the training needed to be deployed on missions. So we were just listening to it and, and, you know, I hadn't met the search and rescue crew, but now we're both involved and we do fire evacuations. We, we report to Lieutenant Odell and work with Virgil and others. And I, I got to say that the Douglas County search and rescue crew, they're, they're the best. Um, it, it, just incredible work and hearing the voices of people, you know, that were recorded. I now know who they are. And, and Virgil was 
uh, you know, it provided most of the photos and video that were in that video segment. So Virgil, I know you're also, you fixed it. Dude. I, think so. no. I don't know. I locked it up. <laughs> not no, only, you know, when you need a search and rescue person, and, you, yeah. and, and for me, this was an emergency and you came through for me and I appreciate that. So I know you're running for office and we're not here to just plug you all the time, but I think you should be known that you're running for it. What's your, what seat are you running for? Uh, the House of Representatives District 2, which is Douglas County. Okay, so let's say you get elected because that's the whole idea here, um, right? Yes. Okay, so when you get elected, what do you go back and wh what do we do? You saw it firsthand. What needs to change in Oregon when it comes to forest management, in your opinion, as a future House of Representatives in the state of Oregon? <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, you're right. I did What I saw was I saw unmanaged forests took off, and, and it was a situation um, that, you know, we didn't have, there were no clear cuts to speak of up there. There were no, there were no fire breaks. There, you know, the, the trees were overgrown, the brush was overgrown, and the fire, because of that, absolutely had fuel. And in fact, a lot of it was burning over the old burn scars from uh, some of the Forest Service property that had burned before and it hadn't been replanted or taken care of. And so, I mean, it just literally was like a giant torch. Um, knowing that, and I'm also a pretty avid outdoorsman anyway, so I know that area pretty well, uh, you can bet that's going to be high on my radar for forest management practices, especially in, in the North Umpqua and on the own sea lands as well. So, Lieutenant, when, when you watch this, um, go on. And I'm not going to ask you anything political like that. Cause I know you're, you know, you're, you've got a job and that kind of thing, but, but this is this, you saw a really dangerous situation that was fast and furious. Yeah, it was, it was extremely dangerous. And as, as it's been previously mentioned, this thing evolved so rapidly that it was almost, we just couldn't keep up. We were getting new information all of the time. I would I would issue a evacuation for a particular area, and before that information was disseminated, we were on to another round in a completely different area. It just it went so fast, incredibly fast. And like I said in the video, I am just so thankful that we did not have a single loss of life or missing person throughout this entire event. That that Virgil said that that was crazy. That's crazy. And then, and then I love the soundbite from the sheriff saying, you know, I've never had to evacuate a whole community before. I mean, that's, and, and that, and, and you guys, you know, you're, Archie Creek, you're just one area that was happening at the, in, in my area, the McKinsey that was happening up in the Portland area out in Estacada, stuff like that. I mean, there were multiple fires all over and it was, um, so, so, so what do we do with that, Matt? Um, in terms of, you know, you're in the industry of, of speaking out for uh, timber operators. Um, what is that conversation and how do the how do people in my audience get involved in that? Well, I, I think one thing just from a, a timber industry perspective is also letting people know that, you know, forest land managers, uh, particularly on the industrial scale, they have a special relationship with the state of Oregon for fighting fires. So while, you know, the sheriff and DFPA and search and rescue were up dealing with their parts of the emergency, you know, Lone Rock Resources and Roseburg Forest Products and Seneca and those big landowners had their folks up building fire lines. So they were part of that first responder community as well. So I think just understanding that that having that local timber industry capacity, it's not just sending logs to the mills. It, it's out managing the land, responding to fire, being first on the scene. So if you don't have those people, you don't have that that first line of defense up there because the federal resources come in much later and they weren't sending in teams uh, for firefighting till later in, into the incident. So that's one thing I, I would want folks to know. Uh, in, in terms of moving forward and the, the human component here and, and, and protecting human lives, you know, the, the feds are leaving most the vast majority of the dead trees out there. And, and so that compounds future forest fires. It makes them more dangerous. Uh, it makes it harder for firefighters to go in and, and respond and, and certainly to get people out of those situations. And so I, I think this is just the first act of a multi-act play and, and things are going to get worse. And, and we need to be thinking about how to stop the spread of these fires. Because I was listening to a report recently and they were saying, 20 and 30 years ago, and I remember because I lived here, there, um, 20 years ago, you did not, this didn't happen. I mean, you had a forest fire was like a rarity. 
know what I mean? Little wins were not a big deal, but these kind like that we've had this year, even here in Montana and there in Oregon, these kind of fires, you didn't see that very often. That's why when my parents would talk about the fire, it was the Tillamook burn back before I was born. I mean, those were the big fires now. So, so we have to look, it seems to me as a, as a people, mm. nothing we've changed it's, isn't working and we need to revamp this thing because it's not doing what it's intended to do, save spotted owl habitat or whatever that is, because it just got wiped out in the fire caused by partially by leaving stuff for kindling and all that kind of stuff there. And, and, you know, and I think people are starting to talk about this, but how do you get that message? Um, there's so much power in the message that's already taken over. How do you get people to change their narrative to go, you know what, maybe this is not all perfect and maybe we need to go back and look at this and, and do some thinning and some other kind of things like that. Yeah, I think so. And, and as people, you know, experience these fires one way or the other, or they have a friend or neighbor who's impacted or a friend or neighbor who was a first responder, they begin to understand that, that these are awful things. These are not nice, gentle, natural occurrences. And, uh, and, and also, if you're an, a conservationist, you go out and see what's happened to waterfall areas or old growth reserves and river riparian areas, like it, it's having a serious effect on the environment, too. And, and, and if you're a human that breathes the air, you're affected in Oregon or Montana or Idaho or Washington. And I think the federal agencies want to attack it. You know, they're dumping billions of dollars into, into firefighting. But I think that we just don't have a, an idea of how to stop the spread of, of major fires, uh, building fuel breaks, uh, reducing forest stocking and, and making forests more resilient to fire. The 2020 fires were, were wind-driven events, you know, 60 mile an hour winds. I'm, I'm not saying that a, a small fuel break would have stopped that, but your regular run-of-the-mill fires, there are ways to, to reduce their intensity and spread. And if you didn't have so much kindling in there, um, you, you know, it, it's not going to just rip through there. Now, Jim says on here, we're in a mega drought. Jim, I don't think Oregon is in a drought anymore. I Is that... Well, this year was pretty good in Oregon. We had a, a really late wet spring and, and we really didn't have too much fire behavior, at least down here in Douglas County. Um, but uh, up to this point, I mean, we, we have been experiencing, you know, longer, hotter, drier summers that, that make the fuels more receptive to, to fire. And, and that's just something that we're having to deal with. And um, between that and fuel buildup, between that and fewer people in the woods being able, available to, to stop fires, uh, we, we've got a problem. So maybe the way to look at that is, if, even if we are in a drier situation, then we need to be looking at that and find ways to change the way we're managing. Because what we're doing right now, obviously, is not working um, well <laughs> when you're doing this kind of fire every, you know, I mean, now it's people just go, oh, that's, you know, that's smoke. That's how it is in the summer in Oregon at the end of September in Oregon. And I don't think it's, I, 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 I hope that we're not at a place we're going to resolve and just go, ah, that's just what it is. The, for, the forest burn up in the, in the summertime, you know. Do, doing nothing is, is not a good option. And, and it, it puts our forests at risk and it puts human communities at risk. And, um, and, and the amount of preparation that the sheriff's department and local firefighters are having to, to put new resources towards addressing these emergencies is significant. I mean, all of the search and rescue people now have to go through advanced fire training and are wearing Nomex clothing that's fire resistant and, and having to learn how to crawl into an emergency shelter. Uh, they, they take it very seriously because they are every summer being sent out to, to help people get out of these areas. Virgil, does that kind of just amaze you that people are willing to, um, you know, it, it volunteer like that uh, to put their, themselves at the on the edge um, to help these folks? Uh, you know, not really. I, I, our team is amazing. Uh, the training that we go through is pretty intense, not just with fire uh, management, but also, you know, navigation tools. We do all kinds of training. And, and I mean, it, this team is so, in, you know, involved in, in, in doing our mission that uh, no, it, it didn't surprise me at all. I mean, we had, we had our, our teams, they, more people wanted to come than we had trucks to put them in uh, to go to respond to this fire. It was, it was pretty crazy. 
Um, and that's just that's just the nature of Douglas County Search and Rescue. It, I don't think you'll find a team in the state that's more dedicated to the mission. Well, and don't you guys think kind of that's I mean, and Brad, you you know, you deal with this kind of stuff, you know, but with I mean, I find people in Oregon, um, even after COVID, like I remember when COVID was like you know, nobody could go anywhere. And then when the fires happened, it was almost like it gave people something to feel again. You know what I mean? Where you could. We, the way people were responding to my wife and me and to people, it was like they're bringing you things. And, and not that people wouldn't do that anyway, but I think because of being locked down for so long, it was like all of a sudden, here's a way I can pour out my energy and do something really uh, remarkable for people. Because I think we experienced the same thing in the McKinsey River Valley is people going out of their way, putting their lives in, in jeopardy um, to go in and help sheriff deputies and rescuers and search and rescuers pull people out and get them out of their homes. Yeah. And I think that that's something that uh, sometimes gets missed in in this talk about this emergency um, is the way that our community responded. We've seen Douglas County residents respond. We've had some emergencies here and we have seen those residents step up and be, you know, how can I help? How can I how can I do something? And we saw that time and time again. We had local business owners that were opening up their restaurants and, and providing free meals to firefighters and police and, and search and rescue volunteers. And we had community members that were bringing by clothing and you know, where can we take items for people who are displaced? And, yeah. and that's really another incredible thing about what we experienced here was the community's response, not only to the emergency, but the after, after action, how can we help people get through this? You guys are pretty amazing. I mean, your your Douglas County is is like old Oregon, um, you know. And you guys, this has nothing to do with our topic here, but I think it's worth bringing up. You have a horrible anniversary coming up on Saturday um, of the UCC uh, shootings, and you guys pulled through that so well, taking care of one another. Um, I have friends who were survivors of that, and they still talk about sheriff's department and how much you guys you know helped and the community and you know i think stuff like this you never want to forget um that it can happen even in a place like douglas county but you want to remember is how people came together and kind of really you guys really did some amazing things for people yeah well, go ahead brad i was just gonna say you know like i said the the community is really um, why we're here. It's why Virgil and the volunteers of Search and Rescue um, exist. It, it's all so that we can give back to the community that gives so much to us as well. So we're happy to we're happy to be here and happy to serve. Well, Brad, thank you for coming on. And, uh, you know, now you're Mr. Hollywood. You've got your own featured show there, movie. And, you know, I, I do hope that you cut Matt in on some of that when you do get a series or something, a television show or chips or whatever it is. That, you know, Matt, Matt gets something in there. Virgil, don't laugh so much. That doesn't, that, that sounds like you're laughing at him, not with us. Well, you know, I was there. Hey, we, we got to give him some crap. And, uh, and Virgil, good luck on your uh, uh, campaign coming up. So, uh, are you good? Uh, and, and Matt, thank you so much. We'll see you guys. You, we'll see you next month with part three um, of what you're doing. I want to thank the Douglas Timber operators as well for all the hard work they do and for helping sponsor what we do. Um, we couldn't do it without you guys. So thank you. Thanks, Rick. All right, you guys, we'll talk to you later. So right. folks, Thanks, that is it. And um, I want to play out a little commercials for my sponsors real quick here because um, that's how we make this thing happen. This is Dr. Michael Bratlin from Chris Dental. Just because we live in Oregon doesn't mean we have to accept this crazy left-wing ideology the rest of our lives. We don't have to succumb to CRT, gender identity, indoctrination, out of control, homelessness, crime, and so on. We can actually make a change and it starts with the next election. Right now, it is our responsibility to make sure that those who share our same values are elected in November. 
Make sure you and everyone that you know actually votes. We can and will take back Oregon. All right. I'm Rick Dancer. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow night with another show. And again, on Thursday night, we'll be checking in with uh, Matt McCarl with New Leaf Hyperbarics tomorrow. And then we'll be checking in with uh, Compton Wine Family Wines out of Philomath on Thursday. Um, also, Bill London will be here to give you a wrap of the week. Um, the news that you won't hear anywhere else but here. And um, Kim Stark will be joining us as well. So all that coming up. We might even have Rob from Charleston, that knucklehead coming on and talking a little bit about it. So got a lot of stuff planned for the rest of the month. Montana Timber stuff, candidates. Betsy Johnson is coming on. So we got a lot of things going on here. Thanks for joining us tonight. Share this on your page so other people can see what's going on and get involved in Oregon. And remember, if you're not registered to vote, do it now. Because if you don't vote, you don't get to bitch.